Hi, the doors will be closing shortly. Right, welcome, welcome back. Hope you've been fed and watered and ready to cope with another afternoon. Um, if we could just focus now, please, um, because we are on the live stream. Just to let you know again, if you don't want to be in the live stream, uh, and if you're at the front and if you get up, you may be caught on camera. So if you don't want that to happen, please stay near the back. We've got a packed program this afternoon. So um, join me in welcoming our speakers for this afternoon. Come on up, speakers. Okay, now the panellists are here. I would like us to take a minute and remember the women that did not survive. Um, I'm just going to try and put, could somebody put their timer on please? So. We'll start now. Thank you. Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly Ziamba. Um, thank you to you all uh, for being here. And thanks to Nordic Model Now for asking me to give some voice to the women who did not survive the sexual exploitation industry. As a young woman, I endured various aspects of the sex industry. Like we've already heard today, I've got a history of child sexual abuse and was sexually exploited in my teens. And that led on to various things, stripping, um, fetish performing, sugar daddying, and selling sex. 
The experience was degrading and traumatizing, and while I do still struggle with the impact of this to this day, I am here and I have survived, and so I've got the privilege now to support women at risk of um, or subject to sexual exploitation um, in, my, in my work. So now, 20 years on, I'm the CEO of an organization based in Coventry that supports, advocates for, and empowers women uh, to live fulfilled lives free from sexual exploitation. We support around 250 women and their children uh, each year through women-centered, women-only, holistic, open-ended, one-to-one support and advocacy. And just in the last couple of weeks, our team has been rocked by the sudden deaths of two women. In their late 30s, 40, one who was pregnant, these beautiful, resilient women suffered trauma their whole lives. They once had hopes and dreams. And we organized a vigil for one of the women, the first woman, just like we've done for four other women in recent years. And before we had even grieved and lit a candle for that for first woman, we received a frantic phone call about the second woman having just died. And I think I can speak for my team, some of them are here today, and myself. We're devastated and we're angry. We're angry that these women fell through the cracks. We're angry that as an organization, we don't receive enough funding to provide the service at the level that the level of intensity that we know these women need and deserve. We're angry that after childhood trauma, these women's suffering continued to the day they died. Man after man, taking, taking, and taking. In 2019, I was at the Philia conference in Bradford and Fiona Broadfoot, who spoke earlier, led a march and a vigil to honor women in prostitution who had been murdered. It was a stark reminder that sex work is not work and a brutal representation of male violence against women. Listening to the names of 220 murdered women, I'm sure that number is higher now, is something that I will never forget. I cried for every woman and for the many women not known about, there are so many more uncounted and invisible women. If a punter didn't kill them, then drugs or suicide did. The sex industry complicit in their deaths. At that time, I thought about Canadian missing and murdered women and girls, indigenous women and girls, and I thought about my baby sister, who actually is now 35, who is still just about surviving. The woman I mar marched for was named Mary Fleming. She was 30 when she was murdered in 1964. She was strangled, beaten, had teeth removed, was stored and then dumped naked. At least seven other women are suspected to have been murdered by the same killer, who was never caught. To prepare for today, I wanted to get to know more about deaths of women in the wider forms of the sex industry, like webcamming and porn. And I did a Google search, and it led to headline after headline. There are so many mystery deaths of women involved in those aspects of the sex industry, and so many suicides. This is one headline. Graduate, 21, died of asphyxia after snuff porn fan, 45, paid her to strangle herself with a ligature for his gratification while he watched at home on webcam but didn't call for help as she was suffocating. To conclude, every one of us can make a difference 
Conferences like this are so important, but it's the conversations that every one of us go out and have with other people in our communities that really can change attitudes. I spent 10 minutes with a London cabbie on my way in for this, and he asked why I was in town, and I told him. And he shared his experiences. He said back in the day, um, he used to be given business cards by the women working, and if he passed off a punter to them, he'd get, fi he'd get a fiver in return. Um, and he recalled that he used to drive one young, beautiful Brazilian woman from hotel to hotel, hour after hour. And she told him she was rolling in cash and that prostitution should be legal. By the end of our chat, that taxi ride, he was genuinely shocked. And he concluded, in his words, that the sex industry was sick, if you really think about it. So my call to you all is to talk to others, to share what you've learned today. We've been bombarded with horrific statistics. We've heard heart-wrenching testimony from women who've survived the sex industry. And I hope that together we can create a world, a world where no women and girls are bought or sold, and that no more women die because of the sex industry. Thanks. Hi, I'm Heli. I'm uh, here to explain the Nordic model, also known as the equality model. I've got a lot to say, so I'm going to say it fairly quickly. You might need to listen back later. <laughs> um, for, this is a personal and important issue for me for several reasons. One, like most of the women up here, I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse, but I also grew up in the shadow of the sexploitation industry. I grew up and indoctrinated into thinking that the sexual objectification, humiliation, and oppression of women is normal. That the female function is to be of service, use, and wherever possible, a pleasure to and for men. It took me decades to realize my beliefs were the core of my, our, female oppression. I live in the Netherlands where prostitution is legal and I am appalled by the casual acceptance of the notion that some women choose to be fodder for men and that non-prostituted women have a right to the amorphous and non-existent safety that other women being prostituted is supposed to provide. The Nordic model is the only approach to prostitution legislation and policy that recognizes prostitution as a part of the structural oppression of women and other marginalized groups. It is both a cause and a consequence of the persistent inequality between the sexes. It is an abuse of all women's human rights. If one woman can be bought any woman or girl can be, as pimps and sex traffickers know. The model was introduced in 1999 after extensive research that revealed A, the extent of women's suffering in prostitution, and B, sex buyers' ignorance and lack of care of the consequences of their choices and actions. The researchers developed the idea of one-sided criminalization, where buyers, rather than those selling sex, would be held accountable. In brief, the Nordic model decriminalizes selling sex because no one should be criminalized for enduring exploitation and abuse. It invests in services that provide support and genuine routes out of prostitution. Most research shows that about 90% of the women at any given time want to get out but don't see how to. The services need to include access to safe and affordable housing, training, health care, child care, legal and financial advice and aid, emotional and psychological support and drug rehabilitation. The Nordic model makes buying sex a criminal offence with the key aim of changing men's attitudes and behaviour. 
It aims to create a society where no man could even imagine that he has the right to sexually exploit another human being. The men are fined rather than imprisoned, which provides funding for the services. The model strengthens laws against trafficking, pimping, and brothel keeping. Included with all the above, there needs to be a plethora of holistic measures, including public information campaigning, education in schools, training for the police, long-term investment in services and alternatives for women, and real, concrete, and concerted measures to address poverty and inequality. Where the Nordic model is well implemented, it has been shown to reduce the size of the industry and create a hostile destination for international sex traffickers. In Sweden, it has brought about a change in the culture and men's behavior. It has widespread public support, particularly amongst women and young people. Prostitution hasn't been eliminated, but surveys indicate that the percentage of Swedish men who buy sex dropped from 13.6% in 1996 to 7.4% in 2014, of which only 0.8% said that they had bought sexual services within the last year. It is not surprising, therefore, that the sexploitation industry hates the Nordic model. They insist the model is more dangerous for the women involved, which is simply not true. Nothing can make prostitution safe, which is why the Nordic model aims to give women genuine roots out and to prevent particularly girls, but all more marginalized young people from being drawn into it. The sexploitation industry wants full decriminalization, which means that prostitution is regarded as a standard business. Pimps and brothel keepers are transformed into legitimate business people, and there's no public funding for services to help women exit. Laws against trafficking are retained, but in practice, they're almost impossible to reinforce. Decriminalization is held up by lobbyists as the best approach to prostitution. New Zealand pioneered full decriminalization in 2003. It has now been in place for 20 years and it is claimed by lobbyists and including the New Zealand government, that there has been a decrease in the number of people involved, that it's safer for women, that women can refuse clients or particular services, that brothels have regular health inspections, and that condom use is compulsory. These are the claims. However, the data in New Zealand's government's own assessment does not support any of these claims. So, we have these available, what really happened in New Zealand after prostitution was decriminalized. Please take one and read one and pass on the information on your way out. The data shows that after the law was passed, there was a rapid increase in the size of the industry. Violence and coercion remain rife. Women can seldom refuse clients or specific acts. Unprotected sex is common because men always or nearly always ask for it. And there have been 11 brothel inspections in 12 years, even though more than 1,000 brothel licenses have been granted during that time. Another claim is that there's no sex trafficking in New Zealand. In reality, there have been no prosecutions in the 20 years that decriminalization has been in force. However, there are 133 recorded cases that meet the international definition of human trafficking from in the nine years to 2011, and certainly many more cases since then that were never recorded. When sexploitation becomes legal, it always leads to an increase in the numbers involved not least because it sends out a message of official approval. Prostitution is a normal job. Buying sex is no different from getting a haircut or going for a pint, which means that men visit brothels more frequently. 
When sexploitation is legal, in combination with the increase in the numbers involved, the police have less oversight. Sex trafficking is undetectable, therefore, in effect, it is also decriminalized. Under the Prostitution Reform Act, legislation, sex crimes against children are considered minor offenses comparable to alcohol violations. So most sexual exploitation of children also goes unregistered. So please take the flyers. The next slide compares full decriminalization with the Nordic model. The left-hand column shows full decriminalization means selling sex, pimping, brothels, and buying sex are all legal. And because it's considered a normal and legitimate job, there's no public money invested in services to help women exit. The right-hand column shows the Nordic model. Selling sex is legal, but pimping, brothels, buying sex are illegal, and there are specific public funding, uh, there is specific public funding for high-quality holistic services to provide support and genuine routes out to all those involved who wish them. Germany and the Netherlands have legalized prostitution, which in theory is different from full decriminalization. Frankie Myron, a campaigner for full decriminalization says, under legalization, sex work is controlled by the government and is legal only under certain state specified conditions. Decriminalization involves the removal of all prostitution specific laws, although sex workers and sex work businesses must still operate within the laws of the land as must any business. There are many similarities. Both New Zealand and Germany have multi-story brothels operating in plain sight. Pimps and brothel owners are considered respectable business people and men buying prostituted women is seen as kin to uh, having a drink. There is a massive industry with increasing numbers of people involved. This chart uses publicly available data to show the percentage of the population involved in prostitution in six countries. Germany, the Netherlands with legalization, and New Zealand with so-called decriminalization, compared with Sweden, Norway, and France that have all implemented the Nordic or equality model. A much smaller percentage of the population is involved in prostitution under the Nordic model than with legalization or full decriminalization. This suggests that the model is effective in containing, reducing in size, or at least preventing the growth of sexploitation. Campaigners for full decriminalization say the Nordic model is more dangerous for the women who are involved. If this were true, we would expect to see higher rates of homicide of women involved in prostitution in countries that have implemented the Nordic model and lower rates in countries that have implemented decriminalization or legalization. This next chart shows the number of women involved in prostitution murdered by pimps and punters. It is expressed as an average annual rate per 100,000 female citizens during the years in which the legislative framework has been in place. We can see clearly that the homicide of women involved in prostitution is significantly higher in New Zealand, Germany, and the Netherlands in comparison with Sweden, Norway, or France. Therefore, the claim that the Nordic model is more dangerous for women involved in prostitution is patently false. However, we want to be clear. We are not claiming that the Nordic model is safer for women, because we do not believe that anything can make prostitution safe. The terrible fact is that prostitution is a dangerous occupation, far more dangerous than being a taxi driver, firefighter, lumberjack, or police officer. Research published in 2003, carried out in nine countries and available on the United States Department of Justice website show prostitution, prostituted women have a higher rate of post-traumatic stress disorder than soldiers. Nothing can make prostitution safe. 
The above data suggests that when well implemented, the Nordic model's aim to reduce the number of people involved in it is successful. Let's consider geography. This is a satellite image of New Zealand. It's a small country with a population of about 5 million. It is uniquely isolated, has no land borders, and apart from some tiny Pacific islands, its nearest neighbor, Australia, is more than 2,000 miles away. Germany, in contrast, is a large country with a population of approximately 84 million. It is in the center of Europe and has land borders with nine other countries. Both countries are sex tourist destinations, but Germany's mega brothels are only a short drive or a cheap flight for Europe's approximately 300 million male citizens over the age of 14 in comparison with uh, approximately 1.8 million in New Zealand. Moreover, the European Union's open borders policy make trafficking young women from poorer regions to Germany's mega brothels very easy. Any negative results of legislation will be more obvious in Germany than in New Zealand. In Britain, who could doubt that we are more like Germany than New Zealand? We have a population of about 67 million and are very close to mainland Europe. We need to pay close attention to what has happened in Germany because we would be looking at a similar situation if full decriminalization or legalization were implemented here. So we are thrilled to have Hushka Mao to, with us today to tell you about the prostitution system in Germany. Over to you, Hushka. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Huske Mau. I am from Germany. I am an activist, author, and humanities scholar. I am currently writing my doctoral thesis. I am also the founder of the ELLA Network, an advocacy group for women and girls in prostitution who want the Nordic model in Germany. I myself was in prostitution for several years. My first pimp was a German police officer. Also, I've wrote the book Entmenschlicht, warum wir Prostitution abschaffen müssen, that is, dehumanized why we need to abolish prostitution. Germany has long had a legalizing prostitution policy. I would like to talk to you today about the consequences this has for German society and for women and girls in prostitution. I'm not only speaking from my own experience, but I will also present you with findings from studies and statistics on this topic. It doesn't matter under what conditions prostitution takes place. It is and remains sexual abuse. The yes given by the prostituted woman is not a yes to sex. It is a yes to the money she needs. It's still a no to sex. Unwanted sex is sexual abuse. A banknote doesn't change that. Sexual consent cannot be bought. It is a problematic behavior that John's exhibit when they sleep with a woman when they cannot know whether she really wants the sex. Imagine a friend telling you this. Last week I had sex with a woman. I liked the sex, but it just occurred to me that I don't know if the woman even wanted the sex. Told this, you would be horrified. But in prostitution, that is exactly what happens every single time. Prostitution is problematic because it allows men to have sex with women without establishing consent. Accept, accepting and legalizing prostitution as a system has brought nothing positive to our society. The goals of the liberalizing laws in this regard, that is making prostitution safer, removing crime, 
giving women access to social systems were all missed. So what happens when a society legalizes the buying of sex? First, legalization means that aspiring women are no longer provided with exit programs. And that is only logical if we treat prostitution as a completely normal profession. Because a baker, a hairdresser, a theater director, too, doesn't need an exit program to change jobs. So why would prostitutes need one? Second, because of legalization, men's sexually problematic behavior is deproblematized and sexual abuse is concealed. Everything in the prostitution system is being renamed. Brothel operators become landlords, johns become customers, and prostitutes become service providers. None of this changes the trauma and hurt that prostitution produces, and it does not help with the stigma. Wherever there is prostitution, it is women who carry the stigma and are supposed to be ashamed. Legalization only means that Johns no longer have to be ashamed of what they do, if they ever did at all, because now they are buying a normal service. Third, Johns are confirmed and encouraged, encouraged in their behavior by liberal prostitution laws. If they are not satisfied with what they get, the service or performance, they try to take affected women to court or they demand the service they claim through force. They believe they have a right to sex. After all, they paid for it. In Germany, we even had a case in which a John dragged a 19-year-old girl who had slipped into prostitution because of an unprocessed rape into court for fraud because he had not had an orgasm. Fourth, the behavior of Johns is brutalized wherever the purchase of sex is permitted. The sexual practices are becoming increasingly violent and humiliating because, after all, it is a normal service that is being booked. Johns are treating women more and more like commodities, not like people. Legalizing sex purchasing also leads to more rapes and murders of prostituted women. In Sweden, where the Nordic model exists, there have been two murdered prostitutes in almost a quarter of a century. None of the cases had to do with prostitution. One was killed by her ex-boyfriend, one by her drug dealer. In Germany, we count over 110 women and girls murdered in German prostitution over a comparable period of time, that is since 2002. They are women like Andrea, who suffered from a mental disorder at the age of 19, was no longer able to serve clients and was therefore tied to a concrete slab by the brothel owner and thrown alive into a river where she drowned. Or women like the 21-year-old Ukrainian Olga, who wanted to get out of prostitution and was therefore killed by her pimp and stored in a freezer where she was only found years later by accident. Or like Doris, who was stabbed by a client because she didn't want to perform oral sex on him for 10 euros. 110 dead women and girls in, Germany, in German prostitution since the year 2002. Nothing and no one will bring them back to us. Fifth. Legalization produces more Johns. Laws have a normative effect. If lawmakers give feedback that it's okay to do something, more people will do it. We see the consequences in Germany where over a million men go to brothels every day. Sixth, where there are more punters, more money ends up in the red light district. New brothels are opening, and that means more women are needed to work in these brothels. This is where traffickers and pimps come into play. 
There will never be enough women who sell sex voluntarily, whatever that means. The majority will always have to be forced. A society that accepts and, legalizing, and legalizes prostitution is a society that simultaneously accepts human trafficking and forced prostitution. Legalization leads to more johns, leads to more brothels, leads to more human trafficking and forced prostitution. Because pimps and human traffickers see the opportunity to make a lot of money here. It is a downward spiral. More johns, more brothels, more trafficked and forced prostitutes and with that, a dullness of johns and society towards the suffering of women so that even more men become johns even more brothels exist and so on. It's like a pull and more and more demand from clients means that more and more women and girls are being pulled into prostitution even by force. After all, you can make money with them. Germany is the brothel of Europe and it has worked hard to earn this title. Seventh, the fact that forced prostitution and human trafficking are formally prohibited here does not change this. Because pimps and women traffickers use the legal structures they find here. It is legal brothels, licensed street prostitution where the violence takes place. In Germany, forced prostitution mainly takes place in legal brothels. Eight, for a society more chance also means more men who behave in sexually problematic ways and who find sex without consent and sleeping with a woman who actually doesn't want to, to be okay. This behavior does not stay behind closed brothel doors. Johns carry it out to the rest of society. It is a behavior that, that has an impact on all women because all women in a society have to deal with Johns whether they know it or not. And wherever the purchase of sex is accepted, the rate of sexual assault on non-prostituted women also increases. Nine, any, any liberalization of prostitution leads to a dulling of society towards violence against women. In Germany, pimps are allowed to laugh publicly on television about the fact that the police consider it slavery when their women have to work 16 hours per day. Pimps, human traffickers and brothel operators have an incredibly good love in Germany. 10. Legalizing and accepting buying sex deepens and reinforces every single form of discrimination that can exist in a society sexism, racism, classism, and others. Because that discrimination is linked to sexual degradation through prostitution and is acted out. Ethnicity, for example, becomes a fetish. Women are advertised, sold, and bought on, based on, on assigned racial characteristics. A John who buys submissive Asian woman in a brothel twice a month will no longer perceive Asian women without prejudice, even outside the brothel. Prostitution not only arises from misogyny and racism, it also leads to even more misogyny and racism. In Germany, we live in a society that sees no problem in the fact that masses of young women from certain social classes and from the poorest countries in Europe are trafficked and abused as sex slaves for German men. Compassion and horror are replaced by a party atmosphere and a barely concealed sensationalism. This is degrading, inhumane and racist, but it is precisely a consequence of the fact that prostitution in Germany is considered an untouched man's right. And, as an, and incidentally, as an opportunity to act out colonialist and racist behavior. When the wild promiscuous woman, the submissive Thai, the hot Latina, the anal sex hungry Brazilian with the big butt, and so on. Legalization means creating and tolerating more racism. 
Johns even try to buy women who have fled Syria and the Ukraine. 11. Where buying sex is considered okay, there's an anti-lust and misogynistic sexual morality that aims to replace sexual consent with a banknote and that implies that sex is something that men have a right to and that women have to provide. Buying sex means persisting in the worst traditions of sexual behavior. Everything is geared towards the man's needs. The woman's satisfaction is completely irrelevant and even whether she wants the sex is completely irrelevant. There can be no sexual liberation where prostitution takes place. The legalization of prostitution is something that affects and changes society as a whole. Prostitution is classist, sexist and racist. It is recruited from violence, it is violence itself and it leads to violence. Why do we need this? The fact that men buy sex has absolutely no benefit for society. On the contrary, it does harm to it. I summarize. The legalization of prostitution, especially the legalization of the buying of sex, leads to sexual morality that is hostile to pleasure and is misogynistic. It leads to sex without consent becoming socially acceptable. It means that women can no longer get out of prostitution but are trapped in it. It conceals problematic behavior and sexual abuse by clients. It suggests to men that they have a right to sex. It encourages clients to assert this right to sex through curd or through violence. The legalization of prostitution leads to more violence, more rapes, more murders of women and girls in prostitution. It also leads to more men becoming active as jumps and thus creating demand. This in turn means that it becomes good business for pimps and human traffickers to force women into prostitution because there is a lot of money to be made from them. So more jumps, more brothels, more human trafficking and more forced prostitution. The legalization of prostitution leads to a horrendous image of women in society and thus to more violence against women who are not in prostitution. It also makes society numb to the suffering and misery of women and girls who are exposed to violence. Legalizing the purchase of sex reinforces all forms of discrimination that can exist in a society. Misogyny, racism, devaluation based on social class and so on. These are the results of legalizing sex buying that we can see and we realize this is the wrong way. We don't need any of this. We don't need the buying of sex. We don't need jumps. This all can go away. We want more equality. We want more humanity. And we know that we can only achieve this if we abolish the legalized prostitution system and introduce the Nordic model. The Nordic model leads to fewer chance, fewer forced prostitution and fewer human trafficking, more safety for women in prostitution and more equality. That is what we want. And we abolitionists in Germany are working hard to establish exactly that. Because things can't go on like this. All the dead, raped, injured, exploited, physically and mentally damaged women and girls every day. All the brutalized men who think buying women is okay. We don't want that anymore. We will abolish it. Wish us luck and thank you for listening. I will, I will now hand over to Esther, who's going to speak about Andrew Tate and the fact that he's not an anomaly. Hello, um, my name is Esther and I am a survivor of prostitution and pornography. 
And we've talked to you about how Andrew Tate isn't an anomaly and how tackling sexual exploitation involves tackling demand and challenging its online facilitation and normalization. Can I have the next slide? So, Andrew Tate is an imitator, not the originator of lover boy pimp strategies. They are very common everywhere. So common in Romania, to which Tate extradited himself, that the UK government has helped to fund campaigns there warning about them. Their activities have resulted in thousands of young Romanian women being trafficked across Europe and to the UK, where commercial sex websites are the equivalent of the German mega brothels. The Home Affairs Select Committee in the Westminster Parliament has been conducting an inquiry into human trafficking. The Director General of the National Crime Agency, or NCA, told the Home Affairs Committee that the people responsible for this live outside this country. Indoor prostitution, which is the most common and most hidden form of prostitution in the UK, is mainly facilitated through commercial sex websites run by companies registered in the UK. It's also facilitated through social media, through dating and hookup sites, and in other online spaces. But in the case of commercial sex websites, sexual exploitation is the primary purpose for which they exist. They concentrate demand. The UK company which owns one of these sites, Viva Street, is owned by a company registered in Malta whose owner lives in Spain. The UK company which owns its main competitor, Adult Work, is apparently owned by a company registered in Panama. For a buyer, access to a woman they can pay for sex is just a click away. Every other avenue for accessing prostituted women involves more effort, more time, a higher level of prior knowledge, and a higher risk of discovery, all of which are potential deterrents to an impulse buyer. These websites have also contributed to huge increases in the numbers of women and young girls entering the sex industry because of austerity budgets, media misrepresentation of what involvement in the sex industry is like, coercion, and trafficking, because commercial sex websites are just a click away. Can I have the next slide? Um, it's the one before that, I think, actually. Um, oh, no, that's the last one. That's it there, yes, thanks. <laughs> Um, in January 2021, the National Police Chiefs Council, or NPCC, successfully argued in the High Court that it was necessary for convictions for loitering and soliciting handed down to Fiona Broadfoot and Julie Swede more than 20 years ago to remain on the police national computer for 100 years in case they applied for positions requiring the highest integrity, such as the police or judiciary. This was before the convictions of sex buyer Wayne Cousins. The very same National Police Chiefs Council and the National Crime Agency collaborate and the NCA is embedded with one of the largest commercial sex websites operating in the UK, Viva Street. Beaver Street advertises its partnership with these law enforcement agencies, which it is using in its own commercial interests to knock out its largest competitor and achieve market dominance at the taxpayer's expense. This has not been addressed by these law enforcement agencies. The Home Affairs Select Committee has democratic oversight of the Home Office including police forces and national police organizations like the NCA and the NPCC. 
the managing director of the company which owns Viva Street, refused to tell the Comb Affairs Committee what her salary was. But prices buyers can expect to pay for access to the bodies of women advertised through Viva Street are advertised on their profiles. Who has the highest integrity? How is this democratic accountability? Andrew Tate is a homegrown pimp. Ministry of Justice statistics on prosecutions for pimping offences suggest it's highly unlikely he would have been prosecuted at all if he had stayed here. His profits from the sexual exploitation of others were facilitated and enabled online, as is now the case with most of those who profit from this in the UK. In 2021, cross-party groups on commercial sexual exploitation in both the Westminster Parliament and the Scottish Parliament published reports on these sites, which concluded that they knowingly facilitate the prostitution of others and are a major enabler of it. The Scottish report said that the scale of sexual exploitation and trafficking facilitated by these sites vastly outstrips policing capacity to respond. It also concluded that collaboration with the sites by UK-wide law enforcement failed to meet objectives, provided political cover to the website companies and underplayed the level of threat they pose. The NCA and NPCC have not addressed these issues adequately. Can I have the next slide? Now the, these, um, I thought I put up for you, this is the text of um, several of these treaties which set out the UK government's obligations on human trafficking. And the top one is Article 9 of the Palermo Protocol. And then you have CEDAW Article 6 and Article 6 of the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. And you'll see from the bits I've highlighted that these texts clearly refer to the exploitation of women and girls and the exploitation of prostitution of women and not only to the act of trafficking in the sense of travel. They make an explicit causal connection between domestic demand for prostituted women and sex trafficking. This connection is evidence-based, as we have seen. Demand for sexual exploitation through prostitution is a barrier to women's equality. Exploitation through prostitution and therefore sex trafficking only exists because of demand. Profits for traffickers wouldn't justify the risk if demand was constrained by enforced sanctions against buyers and there was a greater focus on supporting women to exit. No effective measures are being taken to protect women from predator pimps like Andrew Tate in England, Wales or Scotland because no steps are being taken to address demand. As sex trafficking is the most frequently detected type of trafficking globally and the most profitable, we should be seeing higher numbers of prosecutions for sex trafficking than for other types. The exact opposite is the case. The Scottish Government has said it regards prostitution as a form of violence against women and girls. In February, the Home Secretary recognised violence against women and girls as a national threat alongside terrorism. In June, the National Police Chiefs Council published updated guidance on prostitution-related offences in which it said that prostitution was not necessarily violent. You see how they moved the goalpost there. The criminal justice system has suffered bigger budget cuts since 2008 than many other public services. And the announcement that violence against women and girls is an equivalent threat to terrorism has not so far been matched by equivalent resources. All the same, seeking to avoid potential resources for tackling profiteers who exploit others through prostitution by changing these goalposts is very cynical. The National Crime Agency also told the Home Affairs Committee, there is a demand for sexual services in the UK which has created a sexual services marketplace 
where both autonomous, self-determined sex workers operate alongside traffickers exploiting victims of sexual exploitation. NCA does not aim to reduce the demand of legal sexual services. However, it is undertaking work to tackle the demand for sexual exploitation. The demand for trafficked victims of sexual exploitation cannot be tackled without reducing demand for prostituted women wherever they come from. When the committee chair asked the NCA Director of Operations for a comparison of the percentages of posts on Viva Street from autonomous women compared with trafficked women, he couldn't provide this. The NCA has based its decisions to put the UK government in a position where it is not complying with international treaty obligations on a claim it cannot evidence. Academics with whom the NCA and the NPCC have been cooperating refer mainly to the USA, where the role of the state in providing health care, benefits to alleviate poverty, and other means of reducing inequality is extremely limited. Are those on the left who champion sex workers' work seeking a similar rollback in the UK? They're highly selective about which neoliberal practices they favor. Would they support US laws relating to gun control or hunting animals? The operational difficulties law enforcement agencies have been having with bringing prosecutions is evidence in favor of targeting buyers in the UK. It's not evidence supporting collaborating with pimping websites, which are clearly keen to recruit former police officers with all the inside knowledge or intelligence they have from cases they haven't prosecuted. <coughs> Research has shown that buyers are most deterred by any kind of publicity. It's buyers who are most invested in maintaining the stigma associated with prostitution. Businesses that give them access to prostituted women service this investment. Beaver Street has introduced and is proposing to introduce measures including facial recognition which are mainly aimed at identifying women whose profiles are on the site. These measures will support those rare buyers who find themselves at risk of prosecution because they can claim they couldn't possibly have known a woman was trafficked on a site which had these measures and was supported by law enforcement. Commercial sex websites do not require buyers to provide ID, only the women advertised on them. They place the privacy and public reputation of buyers above the safety of women they do identify and from whom they take money. You compare this with gaining access to a property. Have you ever tried to rent something through Airbnb? Or trying to adopt a cat or a dog through an animal welfare charity? It isn't possible to screen buyers through social media sites because they have fake profiles too, and genuine profiles tell you nothing about whether a buyer abuses women or has alcohol or substance issues which make him a danger. The one measure Beaver Street says it is introducing to protect women from predatory buyers will give women direct access to a police portal. Beaver Street gives reporting time wasters as one of the purposes of this access. That could be a potential buyer who originally acted on Mintpulse and changed his mind. The managing director of the company which owns Viva Street gives such a high priority to tackling time wasters that when the Home Affairs Committee asked whether NCA officers could book appointments with women on the site to check on their welfare, she said this would be unethical even if the officers paid the woman. Restaurants regularly face serious financial issues, due, losses due to customers reserving tables and not turning up. Shouldn't they and other industries which have these problems be able to access a police portal where they can report time wasters who threaten the survival of their businesses. In the next slide, this is a bit of multidisciplinary stuff. Um, the commonized costs privatized profits game, this is a game used in game theory in economics, it's often used by ecologists and environmentalists when they're considering resource allocation. It's closely connected with something else you may have heard of called the tragedy of the commons. Players seek to externalize or outsource costs generated by their actions across the wider community 
while they themselves privatize their own financial or other profits. They're incentivized by this to deplete resources. Private energy and water companies paying large dividends to shareholders while consumers' energy costs soar and taxpayers pay the cost of cleaning sewage and other pollutants from rivers and coastlines are recent examples of this. The business model of commercial sex websites and other companies and individuals profiting from the exploitation of others through prostitution is the same. But the sex industry escapes criticism for this from those who most loudly denounce exploitation of resources at public expense in any other context. Environmentalists and ecologists see population as resources, but they're silent about addressing demand which leads to the sexual exploitation of women and girls. They rail against corporations, but have no issue with the behavior of corporate interests involved in prostitution. An individual player in this game wishing to continue profiting by offloading costs must not broadcast involvement in the game or their use of this strategy. Equal access to information, which democratic societies claim as an important value, is costly to a player seeking to win. Transparency, like freedom and equality, may be championed in public, but misleading claims, deception and secrecy bring individual players higher rewards. Doesn't that sound like the sex industry? Andrew Tate's indiscretion and his sharing of a strategy contributed to his undoing. The strategy and the profiting from sexual exploitation of others more generally continues and will do so while demand is not addressed. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your attention and thank you Nordic Moderna for the invitation. Uh, Ursula Le Men and myself, Alissa Rabar, we represent Oser Le Feminisme, which is a French organization of national interest, um, which is uh, awareness raising and an advocacy organization. And for three, four years now, we have been actively working against the pornography industry in France, notably through uh, strategic litigation and two ongoing um, cases. So maybe we can go to the first slide and we will uh, talk about it today. So uh, we are a civil party in two legal proceedings. Uh, they are called the Jackie and Michel case after the name of the platform and the French Bukake case. I'm gonna put a timer to, to see how long I am. Uh, and so for the timeline, the instruction of the French Bukake case is now over. The instruction is basically the investigation. It lasted three years. So now it's going to be heard to go to court uh, in the summer. Uh, and regarding the Jackie and Michel organization, the investigation is still ongoing. And that's notably because there is only one police person who is affected to the case and it's a huge, massive one. Uh, so there is a big issue of lack of means allocated to justice and specifically uh, allocated to tackling violence against women in France. If we go to the next slide, um, we, we can see that for these trials, we've been working on this for three years and every step of the way uh, is a struggle for our organization, Ursula will speak about it, but especially of course for the survivors, the plaintiffs of the case. Uh, for them, they have to deal with trauma, um, they have to deal with money issues, sometimes coming to Paris for the hearings, for the expertise is really complicated for them. And in France, there is a legal aid that can be given to the, to the victims of a case, but only after the case is trialed, which can take years. Um, there is uh, psychological expertise which is done by experts that are appointed by the court and we have seen in uh, these cases that the expertise are incredibly misogynistic. They use psychoanalysis and uh, Freudian concepts such, such as hysteria or daddy issues 
um, to explain that uh, basically the, the women are at fault. Uh, and of course, there is no notion of uh, psychotrauma induced by sexual violence. Uh, of course, the videos are still online, which is a huge issue for the victim. In spite of the fact that, that there are ongoing cases, we cannot take away the video. We have tried everything. Uh, and these women are being threatened. They are being harassed in the streets. Um, many of them receive messages on social media saying, if you don't do this for me, if you don't send me this naked picture, I will send this video to your family, to your employer, etc., etc. Uh, so this is all a denial of justice for the victim. In spite of all this, we have achieved uh, successes. 17 producers since 2020 have been put in pre uh, preventive detention. So they have done jail time already. Four of them are still there. <laughs> yeah, we're happy, we're happy about it. <laughs> Um, and uh, the charges are aggravated rape, aggravated procuring, and trafficking in human beings. Uh, so how did it begin and how did we do it? Uh, in February 2020, we have translated a journalist investigation that was published in France into criminal offenses, and we have launched a report to the um, Paris public prosecutor, which, who decided, after reading the report, to uh, start the investigation against Jackie and Michel platform, which is in France a big pornography platform that is not only a website on the internet, but it also has merchandising, sex shops all across the country, TV channels, etc. Uh, it's very well known in, in popular culture, let's say. So there was a massive media coverage when the investigation started, and this helps us uh, grab the attention of the public. Uh, and Ursula will speak more about it, but there was a very positive response by the public uh, about our action. So we issued a call for testimony in the media, and many survivors reached out to, to us. Uh, so, as I said, there are two, two proceedings, so we, have, uh, we are working with seven plaintiffs of the Jackie and Michel case and 43 uh, women from the Pascal Oupé case, uh, which is the French Bukake case. Uh, so that's 50 uh, survivors, but in the slide we put 60 because on the two cases there are 60 plaintiffs, but there are some of them we're not working with. Um, and basically, we are trying to build a holistic support system, so not just help them with the legal aspects of the case, uh, but we are working with 30 lawyers, uh, two psychologists, and one social worker, and we're also trying to help them build support networks between themselves, uh, have uh, spaces for communication, and also meet in person so that they feel less isolated, and also they can understand the systemic aspect of what they went through rather than feeling that it was their fault because many, many of them had spent years blaming themselves. Uh, and I want to quote Lorraine Cassio, who couldn't be here today, but she's uh, the lawyer who is coordinating all of the legal strategy and working directly with all of the women, which is amazing. <laughs> Uh, so I put a trigger warning on these slides because I want to go a little bit on the specifics of the case. Uh, so the trials and the investigations uncovered a very gloomy, to say the least, reality. Uh, the Bukake scenes, uh, not everyone knows what this is, but basically uh, these are scenes where a large number of men who are hooded and uh, they are hidden, their faces are hidden, they go uh, into some kind of uh, garage, uh, yeah, warehouse, I didn't have the word. Um, and so there is one woman who is being raped uh, in the mouth and uh, in her vagina until she chokes. Um, and then everyone, all the men, is ejaculating on her. Uh, and she's put on a pallet and it, it, look, it is a torture scene. Uh, and some women are penetrated more than 80 times in a very small amount of time. Uh, so, of course, with all of the consequences on health. And what is really important to highlight uh, in this is that we talked about this this morning about, uh, yeah, but there are men also in the pornography industry. For the large part, these men that we see on the videos, they're not porn actors. 
they are producers or they are consumers of pornography. And that was the case for these scenes. Pascal Lope would put on Twitter a call saying to men watching the videos, you can come to this address at that date with your ID and a mask. And these men came to rape women on camera. It's everyday men, fathers, sons, husbands, and so on, colleagues. Um, and so far, they are not being prosecuted. Uh, 500 of them were identified through the, organization, uh, through the investigation. Regarding still the Pascal Lope case, uh, the investigation uncovered the high level degree of organization and strategy behind uh, this uh, industry. Uh, and notably how the victims are targeted and uh, groomed, manipulated and coerced into making these videos. Um, one of the key actors was Julien Day, who, is, um, who created a fake profile of a woman uh, named Axel, uh, and he would target women online, uh, most of them in uh, econo uh, uh, disadvantaged economic situations, most of them very young. Um, and therefore vulnerable, and so he would uh, pass as a woman, say, uh, oh, uh, I'm doing a es luxury escorting, uh, it's really empowering, it's really, it makes me a lot of money, etc. you should try it. Then they would go to see a client, but the client would never come, it would be Julien coming to rape them. And through this first rape and the psychotrauma that are associated with it, he could then uh, ensure control over them and tell them, oh my God, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Okay, you still need money, don't worry, I know something. It's less money, but it's safer. You will go to this place and you will shoot a video. It will be very confidential, it's for foreign news only, and then uh, you will get the money. And uh, in, in fact, when the women came to, to the address, they would be uh, sequestrated, some of them for several days. There would be torture, drugged without their knowledge, raped on camera, and so on. And these are the videos that are on the platforms, the mainstream platforms, and that people and every man, man that you know probably is masturbating to um, every day. So I want to quote uh, one of the plaintiffs from the Pascal Lope case. Uh, it's an extract from a longer video, testimony video that she made that I translated in English. That weekend, I was raped and sexually assaulted. They took sadistic pleasure in pushing the limits of horror. I cried, I said no, I pushed them away, but it only made them more violent. No one ever stopped. For those 48 hours, they never called me by my first name. They gave me the meal, they fed the dogs. I'm still there seven years later. I will now give the floor to Ursula. Thank you. So the goal that we're trying to achieve with uh, those cases is obviously to take pornography and get it out of the lawless zone that in which it is right now, because we have the legal um, system that can actually um, condemn those crimes, but nothing was happening, so that's the goal, and we don't need new laws, they already exist. Obviously, uh, rape is a crime, but we have to see, uh, we have to um, help the legal system see these as rapes, which of course they are. O also, we want justice for the victims, some of the victims have been trying to get justice for themselves for 10 years and no one was listening to them. They were going to uh, lawyers, they were going to the cops and all of them were saying, well, you're a porn actress. You knew what was going to happen, right? So some of them were denied justice for a long time. So this is, I think, our first uh, intent with those cases. And then because we have the Nordic model in France, pimping is already illegal and is defined in uh, the, in the um, criminal uh, code as profiting from someone else's prostitution. So our analysis is that if the justice system sees prostitution, um, sorry, pornography as prostitution because uh, prostitution is getting money for sexual acts, so it should apply to pornography, then if you have um, a case that and a court decision that says that it is actually, yes, prostitution, then profiting from this is pimping, and it will render the production of pornography illegal in France without the need of new legislation. So that's the goal. We're not there yet because uh, we'll, 
I will talk to you about now the, the challenges that we are facing because the prosecution is refusing to see um, pornography as prostitution and therefore production of pornography as pimping as of now. So in the French Bukaki case that is uh, closed now, uh, the prosecution refuses to take into account the aggra aggravated accounts of sexism and racism despite the, fi the facts. So all the slurs that they were um, that you can hear in the videos, the racist and sexist slurs, and the titles of the video, for them, that doesn't count. They're saying, no, that is not aggravated uh, accounts of sexism and racism. Same for torture and acts of barbarism. So some of the, one of the victims was raped 200 times in uh, two days, as they still refuse to uh, accept that this is torture. And the prosecution and the examining magistrate thought so why they are doing this is because they want to avoid the assises. So assises is the court where we judge crimes in France, but there has been a new reform not too long ago that says that assises now are going to judge only the crimes that get more than 20 years sentence. And since they want to avoid to go to the assises, they want to keep the trials in the departmental criminal courts because it's... Uh, well, cheaper for them, that's basically the reason. They downgraded the facts uh, to, to, to rape everything that is max 20 years, so they don't have to go to the assis. So we appealed this, and the appeal already happened. It's unlikely that we will win in the appeal, but we will go to the highest court, which is Court de Cassation. But for that, of course, we need means, uh, we need money, because we have to pay lawyers that are specialized in court de cassation. That's also how you know, they, um, they drain us. Obviously, the industry of pornography has way more means than us. And to, to help and, well, to support our, uh, our involvement in the criminal cases, we also de developed a strong advocacy on the subject uh, in our organization. So, for two main goals, to set up policies against, against the porn industry in regards to the latest investigations, both in France and internationally. We talked this morning about the cases in the US against Pornhub. And also to raise funds to support the victims. So, in regards to our institutional advocacy, we started with the big column in uh, Le Monde, which is um, the news reference newspaper in France. Uh, signed by feminist organizations, but also unions, uh, women politicians that stated that pornography serves as an alibi for women hating torture and organized crime. So that was at the start of the investigation against uh, Jacques Michel and uh, Pascal Lopé. Um, of course, the fact that the case started against um, Jacques Michel brought a lot of attention because French Bukake was a very small platform, even though they fed the big ones uh, his platform was a small one, whereas Jackie Michel is one of the two biggest in France, is a household name. So this really helped to put the pressure on the media to interest, interest the media, so then when you have the subject in the public uh, space and is discussed in the media, then the politicians will move on the subject. If you don't have that pressure, nothing's gonna happen. So what we also did is to uh, build advocacy towards Arcom and Faros. The old name of Arcom is CSA. Arcom is basically the independent um, administration that is um, that is supposed to control what's on the media and uh, that in, includes internet now. And Faros is basically the internet police. And uh, so we started reporting uh, web porn websites that were, for example, not enforcing age control, which is supposed to be legal in France, uh, I mean, supposed to be mandatory in France, but still not happening. Um, we also denounced a lot of illegal content on completely mainstream platforms, so Pornhub, obviously, X videos, etc., of, for example, child abuse material with kids that were prepubescent very clearly, and nothing was to this day, nothing has been taken off but by Faros. So the, what we're doing basically is to do that and then when they don't do anything, we name and shame them in the media. That's the only way we have to put pressure on them. And also towards Arcom, we reported uh, Jacques Michel TV channels. As soon as the investigation um, and prosecution was announced, we demanded that the channels of Jacques Michel were taken down and they did. They took the channels down. 
because of the name in shame, obviously. But the problem that we have with them is a very time consuming work because you will go to our and they're going to say, oh, not our competence, you have to go to Faros. Then you go to Faros, they say, oh, not our competence, you have to go to Arkham. And they're like this, bouncing us around. Um, also, we developed uh, work in the HC, which is Au Conseil à l'égalité femmes hommes, so it's a high council for equality between men and women. We have one of our uh, members, who's Céline Pic, who's um, super involved in that project who is uh, elect, I mean, appointed in HCE, and she led the work on the report about porn that was published in September 23. And HCE being an, an administration um, figure had more, uh, I don't know, like, um, weight. Yeah, weight in the media and towards the politicians. So that actually really helped a lot to get um, politicians to move. And, as a consequence, after the, after, uh, I will talk about this later, it's right there, but I will say it now. Yeah, it's fine, you can go to the, yeah, and then we, we will go back to the previous one. But basically, after the report of the HCE, the women's rights minister said, declared, let's put an end to violence and barbarism and pornography. So we actually managed to have them talk about it. Now we have to get them to do something about it, but we have the first step at least. So let's go back just before. And then, uh, so we met and still meeting with a lot of politicians. So from the presidency cabinet, ministry of women's rights, MPs, so senators, regional, le local elected official, European parliaments. So that's also very time consuming. So on to the next one. Um, in October 22, uh, the Senate issued the first parliamentary report on pornography, which is entitled Held Behind the Curtains. This report was conducted by four female feminist senators, so it really helps to have allies uh, in elected uh, official position. Following the report, the Senate voted a resolution calling for the fight against pornographic violence to be made a public policy priority. So now, a quote from uh, Laurence Rossignol, who's the vice president of the French Senate and was uh, a reporter of the report I uh, just mentioned. So she said, what we want to say is that the porn industry is toxic in the way it is manufactured as well as is in its consumption. It colonizes minds. We must realize that this is a public policy problem. We have to stop looking the other way. Yes, of course we agree with her. <laughs> um, so to be taken seriously by anyone, basically, I mean, yeah, we grounded and we have to ground our work, our, our advocacy work on scientific data. But of course, we don't have the means to um, conduct any type of national uh, inquiry. So to get the, uh, the data, we have to put the pressure again on society, on the media, on the politicians. So. In the literature review and data collection, we want to show the prevalence of violence against women, racist stereotypes, incest and body criminality inciting content, with of course the teen, schoolgirl, etc. content on pornographic platform. And for example, so the HCE report revealed in 2023 that 90% of the pornographic content uh, contains physical or verbal violence and is therefore criminally reprehensible. Of course, we knew that, but the politicians they do need those data to move, so it really helps. Uh, we also collect data concerning online sh child abuse and image-based sexual abuse and about the median age of the first exposure to porn. We didn't have even anything on, in France about this, about the first exposure until a few months ago because of the Ashia report then, the biggest, um, well, study, Institute of France did a study and, I mean, revealed what we obviously knew that it started at 12, 12 13, 14, but now apparently everyone knows, <laughs> which was obvious to us, but actually it, it, it stirred quite a debate in the, in the French society. And of course dispels the myths uh, surrounding sorry, the porn industry using research or such as they deserve it, they are willingly doing it, etc. Also we campaigned on social media a lot because we are well known for our social media campaigns. We have 100,000 followers on Instagram and 120,000 followers on Facebook. 
And we did twice a campaign that's called Balance Ton Porn in November 2020 and 2021. And then we started a campaign called Puis le porno est entré dans ma vie, so it means uh, when porn entered my life, uh, which started in summer 2023. Those campaigns used both scientific data and testimonies. So then on the next slide, you have just examples of the visuals that we put on, on social media. So we highlighted how pornography is racist, lesbophobic, misogynistic, promotes pedocriminality and incest, and affects everyone's sexuality. We also analyzed porn, business model, and debunked the so-called ethical porn, which is the number one argument that we're obviously facing on social media. These campaigns have met with a strong response on our social networks, and the overwhelmingly the reactions were at last a feminist Insta Instagram account that criticizes porn. Because, I mean, all women live the consequences of porn in their everyday life, and then you have to read about it on Instagram saying that it's liberating. It's obviously not making sense to, the, uh, sense to them. So it was, I mean, we got a really strong response and it shows that you, we shouldn't be afraid of talking about porn online. Um, and besides that, the analysis of porn culture is at the core of all our social media content on any subject matter. Uh, for example, we keep our followers up to date with the criminal investigations that we are a part of. We share the voices of the survivors and we denounce the impunity strategies of the porn industry. Also for campaigning and raising awareness, we participate in high level events such as the, of, uh, the conference of the city of Strasbourg uh, that was solely on pornography last year. So it was 1,000 attendees. Filia or this conference, for example. <laughs> We organized protests, events, webinars to educate the general public, and we also published a sex education book that addresses porn and its consequences for the youth. Finally, um, the challenges, challenges that we had to face and are still facing in our organization to tackle this, well, first is the funds, obviously. We had to triple our budget in three, year, three years to pay for the trial's expenses because I mean, Alisa said that before, we weren't at all a service provider before, we were advocacy only. And uh, so it needs way more funds to do any type of uh, service providing. And to get the funds to do the service providing, we have to do a lot of, of advocacy work, which is uh, volunteer. So it, it's, a, it's a struggle. And then the second uh, struggle is that this work relies on very few activists for two main reasons. The first one is that it's, it's a difficult subject, of course, and most women have a traumatic relationship with porn, which is not necessarily the case with prostitution, for example, but for porn, I mean, the women from our generation, for example, we all grew up with men that were fed with porn, so we all have a relationship to porn, even, even when we haven't watched it. And then the second difficulty is to integrate new activists in that work, because it's such um, the, the work is already well advanced and then it requires to be aware of the big picture of the cases and that's why it's difficult to integrate new activists in the work. Thank you. I want to open a little bit to international level but I will be quick because I'm aware that we're running out of time. Uh, so the response to pornography needs to be global. Uh, in France we're, and in Europe, we're doing a lot of network building and we are trying to mobilize beyond the feminist movement because as you are, I think, in this room well aware of, um, it's sometimes very hard to make people feel uh, that women, uh, situations impacting women and violence against women is important. Uh, but pornography is not just about violence against women. It's, there is no way to tackle any of the social issues from racism to pedocriminality to uh, classism without tackling pornography because it's at the root it, of, um, of the ideology that promotes all of these uh, oppressive systems. Uh, so we're trying to do that. We're also working with coalition from the global south uh, against MindGeek and uh, uh, with uh, the Brussels Core at EU level, which is a coalition of organizations against prostitution, and we're trying to bring this analysis uh, on pornography as well. Uh, we see a lot of backlash, 
And in France, you, uh, Ursula has explained at national level the progress and the impact with the Senate report, the High Council report, the media coverage. But France, meanwhile, meanwhile at European level, in the Council of the European Union, is completely destroying the efforts that we're doing at national level. Uh, so notably, I want to mention the, the proposal directive on violence against women and girls. Maybe you know, uh, since 2022, the Commission has made a proposal for a comprehensive text to uh, set up minimum standards for, for the protection of women and girls in the EU. Uh, these texts uh, at the beginning mentioned sex work. Uh, but thanks to the feminist mo mobilization at EU level, this was taken away uh, of the text of the directive. The European Parliament worked a lot with civil society to provide amendments for a stronger text. Uh, but when it came to the Council of the European Union, it was a whole other issue. So the European Parliament is supposed to represent the interests of the citizens, it's directly elected, and the Council of the EU uh, represents the member states. So it's members of the ministries of justice from the member states who gather. It's very, there is a lot of opacity, it's very hard to know the content of the negotiations, and they also brought amendments that completely emptied the text of its substance. Um, and um, what I want to mention is the Article 7 to 10 of the Directive proposal that are very important because they tackle uh, violence against women online, which is something that is a void in the legal frameworks because it's quite new. Um, for instance, in the Istanbul Convention, there is nothing on this because it was not a problem at the time. Uh, so these articles, which are really important, France is pushing for their limitation uh, first of all, they, are explaining, they, they added an amendment uh, to, to highlight they are supporting an amendment that says that non-consensual sharing of intimate and sexual picture online can only be criminalized if it's made in a public space. And in the introduction, the directive defines public online space as excluding WhatsApp groups, private forums, uh, spaces where you need a subscription like OnlyFans. So basically, a uh, majority of cases that are very harmful to women. So this is completely um, dangerous uh, and preventing us from really fighting the issue. Uh, there is also the argument of freedom of expression that is brought on again and again and again, and not just on this directive. There is a proposal directive on uh, child sexual abuse content online. Uh, to regulate it, and they are using also freedom of expression. We're speaking about child sexual abuse material. In the Council of the EU, they are using uh, data privacy and freedom of expression to say, no, no, we cannot control the content online because it's against uh, freedom of expression, uh, which is false. Uh, it's contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, and also, now the proposal directive with the amendments of the Council is creating a hierarchy of the different forms of cyber violence, uh, clearly uh, stating that the acts of cyber violence can only be criminalized if there is a risk of serious harm to the victim. As if the harm could be not serious for your intimate pictures to be publicized online or if you undergo a, a sexual harassment online and so on. So to conclude, uh, pornography is an attack on the fundamental rights of all women. Uh, the violence in pornography, it's important to state, is not a drift, it's the norm. It's the business model of pornography is built on content that are going to be more and more violent because of the uh, accoutrements, how do you say that? The normalization, the more you watch the violent content, the more you're seeking something more and more extreme. Uh, and so the public response we are calling for is the reaffirmation of the fundamental principles on which our society is based, meaning the rejection of hatred and violence and respect for human dignity. Uh, so what we want now is for feminists all across Europe and the world and decision makers to take this issue. Here in the UK there has been also a report of the 
parliament that is going in the right direction. There is an ongoing inquiry by the Swedish government. What we find in France for the success of the trials we told you about, the judges, because it's a cross-border issue, the French judges will not feel comfortable with think, uh, making a strong decision if they don't have good, strong signal that there are that kind of initiative and narrative that is being brought up in other countries as well, and there is a, a, a cross-border movement on this. So this is really important. Second thing that we really, really, really need is money. Um, we have uh, several cases ongoing. We have now 50 uh, plaintiffs that we're providing support to. We're in the summer, uh, we have to pay for them to come to Paris, tell several days to be in the court. We have to pay for the psychologists, we have to pay for the social worker, etc. All of the work we presented today, we do voluntarily. There's a small team of volunteers doing all of this. But for the lawyers, for the, 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 the women working directly with the plaintiffs, we need that money. So we have, a, how do you say, a link for donation that I will post on Twitter with the hashtag from today, breaking the cycle. So if you can, or if your organization can, go to this uh, link and donate, even a small amount, uh, it would be very helpful. Thank you so much for your attention. everyone. Um, I'm Farah Hussain. I'm the director of UK Feminista. And I just wanted to take a couple, I know we're running way over time, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to hopefully add some hope to the anger and inspiration you're probably feeling right now. Um, when I'm in these feminist spaces, it, they feel absolutely inspiring. And listening to survivors is, I, I, it just, honestly, it, 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 it's, um, it's both amazing and horrific in equal measure, what they have to say. Um, and it, and I, um, so it makes me feel inspired, but I also feel very angry at the end of these. But I want to give us all a little bit of hope, maybe, towards the end of the day, looking forward to the general election. Um, so as we all know, we're very likely to have a general election. Well, we're probably definitely going to have a general election next year. It's likely to be in October, but it might be in May. And I feel like it's a really good opportunity to put the issue, uh, to put the issue of prostitution um, legislation amendments onto the agenda. And the chances are, this next year, we will see a change in government. That's what the sort of feeling is. That's what the polls are saying. Obviously, we know polls can be wrong. They've been wrong before. Um, but they might be right this time, and we might get a change in government. And that means that there will be a new party in government who's looking for ideas on what they can do. Well, they know what a woman is well that's... <laughs> I agree. So the, the feminist movement in this country has been reinvigorated in recent years. And now that we've told them what a woman is, and I think they have changed their policy slightly on this, we can ask them to do things that make women's lives better. And the Nordic model is something, as we've heard today, can make a real difference to so many women's lives, not just women who are caught up in the sex trade, but also all of us in society. Um, so... Movement globally is moving in the right direction. More and more countries are adopting the Nordic or the equality model. Um, there are different countries across the world that our next government can look at to get inspiration from. Ireland is very culturally similar to us. France is very similar in terms of demographics and size. There are examples that the next government can look at. Um, but, and we need to show the next government. There is a core group of really active feminist MPs in Parliament. You probably uh, don't know them by name. They're probably not as active as they should be. They're probably not as high profile as they should be. But we can support them to make a difference. And we all have a role. All of us in the room have a role to play to do that. 
Um, so for civil society organisations like UK Feminista, we have a role to give evidence to politicians to show them what it can look like, what a different model can look like, how we can make a difference. But also, all of us in this room, those of us who have a vote at the election, we have an opportunity to vote for parties that have this on, this agen on their agenda. We have an opportunity to vote for parties that put violence against women and girls, men's violence against women and girls, at the centre of what they're planning to do. So speak to your parliamentary candidates, speak to your current MPs, write to them, tell them that this issue is important, tell them that Nordic model now means now, like we want the Nordic model now, and tell them that you're going to base your vote on this. We have a chance for change. And I was hoping that I'd be able to come today and announce a big shiny new website and a suite of resources to support you to make this change. But unfortunately, that's not possible. Um, but watch this space. We are going to, uh, UK Feminista and Nordic Model Now are going to work together to launch a campaign to galvanize public opinion, to galvanize the feminist movement that has become um, stronger in its voice over recent years to tell the next government that we want to see a difference, that we want to see the Nordic model. So those of you who are party members, take motions to your local branches. Those of you who are in trade unions, take motions to your uh, union branches. While, while we have um, been uh, getting angry and inspired and all those things, the other side have been mobilizing. They have been pushing through motions. They have been changing policies. Read any newspaper article and you will see the words sex work and not prostituted uh, woman or prostitution. They have changed the culture and we need to take it back. So I hope I've offered you a little bit of hope. I hope um, I have uh, maybe uh, given you some ideas on how you, can change, how you can turn your inspiration from today into activism. And I hope that look, going forward, we can work together to make sure that the next government changes the law on this. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Gemma, and I am part of Nordic Model Now, and also part of CIS. Go see my colleague down the back. So, speaking of activism, um, and as Farah said, we're angry, I think, today. We're pretty angry, we're pretty upset. Uh, so let's turn that into some action, and let's turn it into some action right now. So, at Nordic Model Now, we want to ban the online sale of women for sex. I won't repeat what Esther said about commercial sex websites, we all know what they do, we all know that they profit from the abuse of women, and we are starting a campaign to get them shut down. And we want you to join us. So, if you go to the next slide. We are putting a petition together, and we would like you to sign it, and we are going to send it to various UK government departments. We're going to send it to the National Crime Agency, we're going to send it to the MPCC that Esther spoke about earlier, who want to be partners with pimps and traffickers and commercial sex websites. Um, and we are looking for the introduction of new offences in England and Wales in relation to prostitution. And we want a new offence of enabling, promoting, and knowing, pro knowingly profiting from the prostitution of another person. And we want these to be used proactively, not just sitting in a piece of legislation somewhere that everybody ignores, willfully ignores, but they are proactively used against those behind commercial sex websites. And we want mechanisms for closing them down. That's essentially what we want, right? This is just the way to get there. Um, and we want ring-fenced funding for services for women involved in prostitution so that they will have viable alternatives to exit the sex industry. And the profits that are seized from these websites should be used to fund the services for women. So let's get the money out of the pockets of the pimps and the traffickers and give it to women who are in prostitution and want to exit. So we are going to send around some leaflets 
we've already done that with a QR code on them. <laughs> so please click on the QR code or go to the website, whatever way you want to do it, um, and sign our petition to tell the UK powers that be that we're not going to sit around while innocent women and children are sold for sex in any country, but especially this one. Ah, thank you, everyone. That was quite intense. Uh, I'm sure it was intense for you back there, never mind me at the front listening to all this. Um, yeah, now it's the um, question and answer time. So um, I was looking, we were looking on Slido. Uh, we've got a question for Hush Hushka. Uh, what it say, this is from Natasha, by the way. Uh, what is the public perception of prostitution in Germany? It sounds like it's viewed as any other activity. What can be done to change that? Um, well, I'm, I'm speaking about prostitution publicly since nine years and we see a change in how prostitution is perceived um, by society. Um, ten years ago there was um, wording like sex work, um, escorts and so on. There were only... Um, escorts and dominas in the in the talk shows and there were many documentaries uh, about how sex work is easy money and it's uh, a nice job for money and i think that has changed we challenged uh, the media makers uh, so there are more critical documentaries and articles now um, and we changed that by um, Whenever we saw a documentary or an article or a politician who, who said something uh, about sex work and it's a job and so on, we, made, we gave that more attention. So we commented on it, we, we shared the link to the article, we, we wrote them emails and mobilized other women to comment on that too. So this is, um, to be honest, um, something like public shaming. So if you, we want to make sure that if a media maker or a politician is uh, standing in a, in, the, in, in a television show or something and is saying something, uh, something that is, I don't, I don't know how to say it, uh, and is saying something that um, denies the harms mm. of prostitution. We want everybody to know and to see that. And you, so you can change that. Comment on everything, write emails, and put pressure on the people who make those documentaries and write those articles. So the change has begun yes. slowly. Yes. It's getting there. Thank you. Um, I, we do have Gail um, live, actually. Um, so hopefully, she, hello, Gail. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Right. Um, we've got a question from. Has anybody got a question for Gail at all? That want to put their hand up, roving mics. Well, I've got a question from Slido here. Let me just look for that. I'm getting better with technology. <laughs> I was called a Luddite the other day by my son. Let's see. Now I've put myself under pressure, haven't I? <laughs> Always away. Sorry, Gail. I did have a question. No okay. Um, we're talking about huge social change. It might take years or even generations. Uh, in the meantime, porn is taking over sex education for men and boys. Well, not even just for men and boys, for, for, 
for all, for women and girls as well. What can we do to change this problem? What can we do? Well, I'm happy to say that what, first of all, I know that you have um, in your country, in England, it's my country as well, what am I saying, your country. Um, <laughs> I was born and bred in England, although I live in the US. So what we need to do is we need to change sex education. I know that it's mandatory where you are, it's not in this country. And so I want to just say that Culture Reframes has just created what I think is the first ever um, sex ed curriculum with a porn critical lens. And what we've done is everything that we can do for our, um, for the teachers. So we have manuals on how to teach it, and we teach it from an anti-exploitation position, that pornography is a form of exploitation. Because I know that in the UK you're dealing with a lot of stuff around sex ed and pornography that's actually almost pro-pornography, if not completely pro-pornography. So I would definitely suggest people go on to Culture Reframed, look up courses and look at the sex education curriculum. It's a holistic curriculum, so we've got materials for teachers, we've got the, the lesson plans, we've got PowerPoints for classes. We've got to begin to shift the narrative around this. And unfortunately, the media has grabbed onto the narrative, of course, because they're in cahoots with the porn industry. And one way to do this is because sex ed is mandatory, is to get into the schools and to force yourself into the schools with sex ed that deals with pornography. Because if you don't deal with pornography and sex ed, what you're doing is you're acting as if we're living in the 1990s. Most kids who deal with sex, who come into sex ed classes, already have a sexual template formed by pornography. Thank you, Gail. Can I? Uh... Yes, go on. I, I just wanted to input on that as well because, as Ursula mentioned, Ozelo Feminism is also working a lot on sexuality education. Um, uh, we wrote a book uh, for teenage girls on sexuality education, including uh, porn critical length, but that's not it because in France we speak about um, af uh, vi uh, sexuelle et affective, so. Um, education to sexuality and relationship and we take it even further in that book we speak about relationship of women to themselves uh, we start with my body is me because as women and girls we are really dissociated from our bodies for several many reasons uh, in society we speak about the beauty uh, standards also for racialized women we speak about sexuality and affective relationships for disabled girls as well um, we, we tackle a lot of issues, we speak of course about sexting and all of the online violence and we conduct uh, interventions in school. First of all, these interventions, they are not enough because even if every children has access to, I don't know, one, two, three, even more hours of sexuality, feminist sexuality education in school, uh, it's not going to, to help us a lot compared to pornography that is one third of the content on the internet and is absolutely everywhere all the time. So it does not, of course, sexuality education prevents us from really fighting at least access uh, for children, to, for children to, to pornographic content. But also what's problematic about these interventions, at least in France, I don't know how it works in other countries, is same in Belgium actually, is that many of the organizations, women's rights organizations that are going into the schools to conduct these interventions are not radical feminists. They are not abolitionists. Uh, they, they are the liberal feminists that um, we mentioned this morning, right? explaining to the children that sexting is completely fine and okay, you just should not show your face and uh, pornography or stripping can be empowering and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this can be also extremely harmful uh, to girls and right now in France there is a will to harmonize the curriculum on sexuality education but it can be either one way or the other. There is a lot of pressure from some organizations on this so this is also a very big red flag. Uh, in my personal capacity I'm a trainer uh, on this issue and um, also other, other issues uh, on tackling 
all forms of discrimination with children. And I have a training program, train the trainer training program on how to talk about these issues with children, uh, either in school or other settings. So if any of you or your organizations are interested, I'm happy to speak about it uh, after the conference. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll just say what I think is really important. It's about the relationships that you have with the young girls particularly, but around you. So we don't all have children, but those of us who do, make friends with people who will talk to your children. So I've gone out of my way to make sure that I have very close relationships with specifically the daughters, but also the sons of all of the women that I love in my life. And um, I talk to their children because I'm their auntie and I can say the stuff to them that their mums can't. So um, last year after watching a program about pornography, I contacted all of my girlfriends <laughs> with children aged between like 10 and 13 and said, is it all right if I talk to them? And they were all like, yeah, no, you do it, you do it, you do it. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and I had a series of conversations with the young people in my life, you know, and just going to them, no, I'm just gonna, because I just, just really bluntly, I'm gonna talk to you about pornography. And the main thing that I said was, it's like, it's all right to be uncool at school. Because once you've seen it, it changes shit in your brain, right? That I can't even explain. But once you look at it, your brain is never the same. So you are better off being seen as being uncool or stupid or any one of those things rather than looking at it when the boys come up and go, ooh, have a look at this, you know? And just trying to encourage the children in my life. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time now, so I now have uh, my first surrogate granddaughter from you know from one of the daughters of my friend who's now 30 it's about each of us as individuals it's not about going into schools right that's important but it only changes when we take make the effort to change in our daily lives with the young people that we come in contact with thank you Have we got any questions from the floor? Yes. Okay, could I have the mic down here, please? Um, is this organization um, gender critical? Um, so, with the Nordic model now, what we're looking at, we're focused mainly on the sex trade and prostitution. Uh, we are mainly focused on women and girls. Uh, we do understand that males, men and boys can end up there and we support them also. So we are supporting uh, all humans to exit the sex trade. Um, it's a stupid term, what does that mean? What does that mean? We know what women are and we know what men are. Yeah, that's we know that women have vaginas and boys have penises, and you can't change sex. We know that. We do know right. that. Is that your question? But what we are looking at, we are looking at the sex trade as well, and we know it is majority of women and girls that are subject to that. If you look at all the statistics, yes. And we do also understand that males can end up in that situation too. So we are there for them and we will we'll funnel them off into the agencies that can cater for them. We will not turn them away, but we will provide them with information. But we are focused on women and girls. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, so... Right, we've got some questions on Slido here. Ooh. I've got my contacts in, they're not very good. Okay, so, uh, Gail, um, this room, I think it might be similar to the question to the other one. Um, how do we make more people, especially young men, care about, that's the thing, care about and understand the links between porn and sexual violence? Um, why should they care about it? Is that what you said? Yeah. 
<laughs> That's the question. Care and understand the about links. How to make them. Yeah. Yeah. How to make them. I'm sorry, is the question for me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know what? That's a very hard question. And it's very hard to answer because now that we've got a generation of boys, two generations of boys being brought up with pornography, it's been normalised. Violence against women has been normalised in their neurons, in their bodies. I think we have to get out there and tell them also what pornography does to them and to try and get them to understand their own bodily integrity as well. We never talk about bodily integrity for boys. We just assume, we just put a very low bar, boys will be boys, they're born like this and there's nothing they can do. And I was once um, interviewing a group of um, former porn addicts and I said to them, what would have been the one thing that would have stopped you going down the rabbit hole of porn addiction? And I was actually surprised by the response and the response was uniform. They said, if somebody would have told us what porn does to our brain, if it would have explained how it changes our neurons, we would never have gone there. So I was actually surprised that that's the way they think. So we've got to really strategize about how to, and I wouldn't say bring men into the movement, men need to build their own movements, but we've got to think about how to get boys to think about their own sexuality and not keep the bar so low that boys will be boys and this is an obvious thing for them to do. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Can we take one from the floor, please? Hands up. I think there's one over there. I'm going to read if that's okay. Hi, thank you very much for today. I'm um, also a survivor. I was trafficked as a minor and spent a long time in the sex industry. Re-educated myself now. Just starting a PhD, etc., and so forth, very similar to your own remarkable stories. But I wanted to bring forward something that hasn't been mentioned today, which is what my research is, is the conviction of perpetrators of the kind of violence that we've been talking about and how it's crucial to deterring future crime of prostituted women and how they, you know, report rape, basically. Um, I know that police officers are often referred to as the gatekeepers or they are the first point of contact of victims of crime such as sex-based violence but within our criminal justice system which I've worked a little bit in there is these huge disparities where women of, um, who've been raped who are prostituted um, their claims of rape go largely unbelieved. So this is research that I have got a very large sample um, and I'm also very vocal about being a survivor. So you can imagine it can be quite vulnerable, it can be quite triggering. What advice would you give to help with law enforcement and the implementation of psychoeducational programs of raising awareness of the myths that we're trying to dispel here that of prostitution and how would you advise to go forward? Because the criminal justice system and its attrition rates are, are her horrendous. And I'm quite alone in it, actually. I've got a huge amount of support, and I work with advocacy. I've done a lot of work, etc., and so forth. But I am, you know, it is a very difficult thing to try to do. I've, it's evidence-based. It's all these things that we're talking about. It's robust. It's premised on empiricism. You know, I'm... But what advice would you give me? Anybody from the panel? Anything. Do you know, really honestly, I'm really sorry, but really honestly, I'd be like, you're better off focusing your energy somewhere else. That's my actual genuine response, you know, than the criminal justice system, because it's not there for us, you know, and, and it's a noble um, endeavor, but actually, really, what we need is, is a change in, in, in people's way of thinking. So rather than focusing on the powers that be, it's about the context and the contacts that we have with each other, you know? There's, this is space for 250 people. There's maybe 200, maybe 300 listening in total. You know? And when you go out, what every conversation, you know, is about, uh, trying to change people's minds. You know, the everyday people in the street trying to say to people, no, women don't choose this. So, like, focusing on the criminal justice system is, like, so far ahead of where we are on a daily level. That, but that's just me. Can I, respond? Can I also... Um, can I respond? 
Yes, of course. I also, I, I personally uh, disagree that we should not focus on the, um, on the justice system because for me, we, d we should do things in parallel, right? I completely agree that the awareness raising of the general public is crucial, but at the same time, if we advocate for leg legislative changes such as the Nordic model, I think all of us here today are advocating for this, uh, in France, what we see is that because the 2016 abolitionist law was not associated by any means or will for the political power to really train uh, the people who are supposed to enforce the law and to truly um, support a change of culture, it's not being properly implemented. So if we completely overlook uh, the justice system and the law enforcement, uh, our, our actions are not going to be effective. Um, uh, Ozile Feminism, we're a member of a network, it's called the European Network of Migrant Women, that is working right now on a project, it's called Fulfill. It's on access to uh, right and justice by migrant women who are uh, particularly targeted, as you know, by uh, the prostitution, the sex trade industry. Um, and we are building a training program for law enforcement and legal professionals, so I'm happy also to, to talk to you about it after the conference. Any other comments, Gail? Yes, um, I actually say um, we at Culture Reframed have had a lot of luck working with the criminal justice system. We've been working with family court judges who deal with a lot of these issues around pornography. Now, I'm not saying as a group they're great, but generally speaking, we have had some luck in finding real advocates who then go back to the child protection organisations and work with the child protection organisations and then have shifted the way that the child protection organisations do that. I, I always do refer to this as I did in my talk as Gulliver's strategy. We throw everything at this. We decide we're going for different groups, take a different bite of the apple, but I don't think that we should separate it into micro or macro. I think it's absolutely important that we work on both the micro level and the structural level of social change. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to draw this discussion to a close now. Uh, thank you, Gail, for joining us for this Q&A. That was great. Uh, Helly, I'm going to invite you up. So just really quickly, I work a lot with uh, women in uh, Mexico where they have one of the highest rates of disappeared women and I work with a group called Snow Apple and um, what we say is that you change, that the easiest, quickest way to change, to change society is by changing culture and the easiest way to do that is by uh, song. So this is uh, the lyrics I found in a book of, in actually a A4 folio a sheet of uh, texts by women of colour. I found it in the 80s and uh, we put it to music. All the fun girls waiting to live All the young girls taking the pill I said All your sisters tired of standing still All your sisters say you won't but you will don't let them kill you with their stare. Don't let them closet you with no air. Don't let them feed you sex piecemeal. Don't let them offer you any old deal. I said, step back, sisters, we're rising from the dead. Step back, Johnnies, we'll dance you on your heads. I said, step back, man, no more hanging by a thread. Step back, world, can't let it go unsaid. 
All the young girls molested at 10. All the virgins who think that they are men, I said. All you sisters hanging out in every den. All you sisters need your own oxygen. Don't let them trap you with their stare. Don't, no, don't let them trap you with their dope. Don't let them treat you like one fat joke. Don't let them bleed you till you're broke. Don't let them cloud you with masculine smoke. I said, step back, sisters, we're rising from the dead. Step back, Johnnies, we'll dance you on your heads. I said, step back, man, no more hanging by a thread. Step back, world, can't let it go on. Said. Thank you, Helly. That was so powerful. I was just shaking listening to it. You know, it was so powerful. Um, right, I'm bringing this to a close now. Um, if you're parents, teachers, work with young children, young adults, you might be feeling quite overwhelmed, but um, there are some people that have put some great resources together, uh, schemes of work, lesson plans, and a lot of them free. So I'm just going to flag up three organisations. We've got Culture Reframed, that Gail mentioned. Um, so um, they've got porn critical se sex education resources for schools, free access. So that's culture reframed. Uh, we've got the Reward Foundation, a British organization, resources for parents, teachers, again, with porn critical lessons, lesson plans, it's free. And then we've got Michael Conroy's Men at Work. Um, it specializes working with uh, boys, uh, and it provides training for teachers and other adults that work with children and young people. And they've got brilliant resources too. Okay, so uh, please, if you've got young children, young adults, or you work with them, please do look at these organizations and these resources. And please share them with your friends and family. Um, I just want to say, culture reframed, have got a online event on Thursday the 16th about the impact of porn on young people. So that's an online event it's this Thursday, 16th. Um, I just want to say to all the speakers, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a difficult topic, but it needs to be talked about. Uh, and thank you volunteers for all your hard work. And also, thank you to those people that quietly donate to Nordic Model now. It's incredible that you do so. And uh, we couldn't run without you with those donations, so thank you. Um, please continue to talk, have the conversations. Like it said, it's an emergency. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be dis discussed. You know, conversations need to happen. So um, I think the... Um, you can follow Mumsnet, uh, Mumsnet, ah, sorry. <laughs> Whoops, I gave myself away. Um, <laughs> now my family know. Um, Nordic model now. <laughs> oh, anyway, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> and YouTube. Um, yeah, so there we go. We've got loads of information there. Uh, and please get in touch if you want to get involved. Um, now we're going to be turning the live stream off because I've got a few minutes.